Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Nabukalevu te monga, ko Rekenekelo te awa, ko Natifiti te iwi, ko te modi toko ingoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora koutou, Nisan Bolivinaka, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you may be, uh, from Whanganui Atara, uh, also known as Wellington, uh, New Zealand. Um, thank you for joining me in this workshop. Uh, and before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, the organisers for all their care and efforts to make this online event happen and uh, the in-person event as well. Uh, and to acknowledge at the same time uh, the weight and grief uh, that may be surrounding them uh, as a result of the recent events at the MSU campus. Um, so thank you to all of them uh, who have made it possible uh, for us to join together today. So uh, my name is Tim Kong. I'm the Director of Digital Experience here uh, at Tapuna Matranga o Aotearoa. Uh, my key role, as I said, there is as uh, director of digital experience, but I'm also the program manager for the Pacific Virtual Museum, uh, which is a project implemented by us in collaboration with the National Library of Australia and funded entirely by the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and Trade in Australia. Uh, this project aims to make visible and accessible the digitized cultural heritage of the people in the Pacific and of the Pacific. Uh, and it does so that, uh, via the website digitalpacific.org, which is uh, on the slide there, uh, and which you're more than welcome to explore as I go through this talk. I am of the Pacific. I am, like many Pacific Islanders, not born in the islands of their parents, nor am I fluent in the language of my father, or fully aware of the nuance of the many customs of the islands. In the ways of the Pacific, my grandfather on my father's side was Chinese, and my mother is Pakeha of New Zealand, Aotearoa. And so I'm not Itauki, or otherwise known as Indigenous Fijian. Additionally, like many other Pacific Islanders, I've lived the vast majority of my life far from Fiji. This lived complexity is ever present as I seek to understand my father's culture and to walk my own path here in Aotearoa. I am also, like all Pacific Islanders, a child of capitalism and colonialism. And by that, I mean I've benefited from these forces, whilst also often being simultaneously ignorant to the impact of these forces on the islands of the Pacific. And like a child, as a result of this project, I continue to learn of this legacy in relation to culture and heritage. Uh, and that has been a challenging and humbling experience. So I present to you today as that person, and I speak with all of the complexity and all of the privilege that is in, present in me as that person. Um, my aim in the rest of this uh, video is to share some of the design, development, and functionality thinking that went into creating this site. Uh, following this video, I'll um, open the floor, but also like to demonstrate a number of functions uh, on the site, one of which we call user contributions, as well as uh, to open the floor to any of your considerations, concerns, or questions. Uh, our project began in early 2020. Uh, and so like many others, or most things that happened in that year was directly informed by the pandemic. In particular, the lockdowns here in Aotearoa. Uh, the first six weeks, six to eight weeks of engagement with our co-design group uh, and with our development team was done totally online uh, and using a range of asynchronous tools. Um, and of course, they were asynchronous mainly because of the time zones we were using. We engaged um, right across the Pacific in our conversations. The core of the website, as you see it, was designed and built over a 20-week period uh, with our co-design group providing weekly feedback. They had full access to the site as it was developed, uh, and I think that was a really important part of um, the nature in which we worked, but also uh, directly impacted what was delivered and what you now see. The aim of this co-design process uh, was for us not just to deliver the website, but most importantly, to uh, engage in ways that honored Pacific relationships, Pacific realities, and Pacific timescales. Uh, we had about 20 to 30 people on our mailing list uh, of that co-design group that we sent invites out to and communicate with regularly. Uh, the core of that group was about 12 to 15 people that join us. Um, our site, as I said, has been informed by their thoughts and by their inputs. A number of them are from the uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museum sector, as well as community members based in uh, various uh, locations. Uh, and their feedback has been directly reflected in the design and functionality of the site. We do reflect that as a result of the medium uh, by which we've engaged online only uh, or online predominantly, this has privileged those that are in Pacific locations with reliable network access, 
uh, and also in roles that enable them to be in the conversation, particularly during the pandemic. Um, you know, the challenges of joining us from home while they were surrounded by uh, their uh, families and, and personal life uh, was a challenge. We built uh, digital uh, and we built with online tools. As I said, there are a number of asynchronous tools to help us communicate and connect. Um, but we also built for the Pacific and the reality of the Pacific as evidenced in this, uh, this tweet here. Um, we knew we were designing and wanted to design for people in the Pacific. Uh, and so what that meant is we couldn't design with European or uh, US uh, network defaults. We had to design with the realities of network and device access in the Pacific as our starting point. And these might see, be seen as real constraints, um, but our designers and developers have really enjoyed the challenge of meeting the needs of those constraints. Um, one unintended spin-off of this approach is that uh, in high bandwidth network environments, like I um, presume most of you are in, uh, the site is very responsive and we hope an enjoyable experience. This approach has meant uh, we've held to a number of guiding principles. Firstly, we build for metadata only. We're not a, a repository. We don't hold any content or records on behalf of our content partners. We share uh, their metadata and thumbnails of any media content. So we have to honor that metadata uh, and not move away from our key aim of making visible and accessible. In short, we want users to uh, get to the source records that content partners hold uh, easily and quickly. So whilst we uh, are always considering how to add functionality to the website, that's about adding functionality to the metadata, not adding features that make our website the point of um, the point of the exercise. We want tech, we actually want people to leave our website to get to the source content because that's where the real the real work is done. Secondly, we build for mobile first. This means we don't design for desktop browsers in mind, uh, but we start with mobile and responsive design uh, in in any story or any implementation that we're doing. Uh, we focus on design elements that fo uh, function to make uh, the key, but not all elements of the metadata visible and accessible. Uh, and we strive to use a visual language, uh, not just written descriptors. And you'll see some of the examples of those as we go through. Thirdly, we build for uh, low bandwidth. Um, sorry, thirdly and fourthly, we build for low bandwidth uh, and high cost, uh, predominantly mobile networks. We want the site to function well on 2G and 3G environments, and also uh, locations where data is expensive. Uh, one of the ways we do this is in our developer pipeline we aim to have no single page on the site be more than about 800 kilobytes in size. Uh, and that includes when we're preparing uh, blog content, ensuring our images uh, are sized and, and um, compressed. We don't show any, uh, we don't have any embeds other than some of our blog posts. We don't embed any metadata. Uh, as I said, we always point people to the locations. Um, we know that this works because users have commented that our site works fast but when they're redirected to source, some, uh, source sites, sometimes the experience can go very slowly as they move from our site to um, content partners' sites. We sought to design for the people of the Pacific uh, and those um, of the Pacific. Uh, and that wasn't just um, in, in the, the technical backend design, but also in the vi uh, visual look and feel. Um, and, th and this really meant not just designing for people in institutions, cultural heritage institutions, um, but for people who may not be aware these institutions exist or that these, rec these institutions hold records of the Pacific. Part of this was we wanted the site uh, visually to reflect something of the Pacific back to those coming to it uh, and to center a Pacific uh, narrative. Whilst its default function, as you can see there on the screen, is to uh, provide search, in one of the first chats with our designer, I said, let's not make the homepage white, uh, like another search engine that some of you may be aware of. Um, so the design, the visual design, uh, I think elements like the, the stars, the birds, the skylines, and the silhouettes uh, of locations uh, are all designed to enable a person from an island or from a region of the Pacific to recognize that shape, uh, that place, that home that is theirs, to select that location and to see the records of that place um, uh, quickly and easily. A homepage design was to make it easy to find stuff as a Pacific person. Often our mental models of the blue continent is of ocean only. But if you're from Chuk, the, Mar the Marquesas, Vanuatu, or um, you know, uh, Samoa, uh, you, these islands, these coastlines are your home. 
uh, and we wanted you to see those. We wanted them to be centered. This approach also allowed us to speak to indigenous naming conventions as you look through the explore locations um, section, uh, and also to reflect how a culture or a community might choose to be labeled. So for example, you won't find French Polynesia on our locations, um, but you will find the names of the five archipelago that make up the region. Uh, and we recognize we lent more into a geographical naming, uh, possibly than a, than a political naming. One of our co-design members called for this approach in one of our first workshops, um, and, and they, they said simply, I'm Samoan, show me the Samoan stuff, which is a, is a really powerful way of thinking about how you design for people in the Pacific. I also want to acknowledge that these locations um, are on the front end of our website. They're on the, uh, are essentially a proxy. Um, because we're relying on the metadata, uh, as I said in the previous slide, of our content partners, there may be records that we are not showing in these location pages that are still accessible in the website. That is, we're looking for location data in a specific field. Uh, and if that location data is not recorded, it won't appear if you access the locations function, but it may appear if you search for it. And that's just the nature of metadata. Um, we wanted to also manage uh, complexity, and we sought to do this by reducing that complexity in how we presented some of our metadata. So, for example, we organize records by media type uh, and offer just six formats to explore on the homepage. This was a bit of a challenge for some of our librarians uh, who wanted to know what if did I mean when I said text, did I mean published or unpublished text? And I said anything with words, is that okay? Um, we also seek to make images, if they're available, the focus, not just the words. Um, keep in mind, again, that we use only metadata. So these are, th are thumbnails, not source images. Um, to view a source image, the user will always be redirected to the source and the content partner that holds it. So just as an example of this uh, reducing complexity, um, this is uh, the search results interface. Um, the next three slides will show how we present uh, metadata in which the hero is the image or the thumbnail. So this is the search results interface, um, and you can see how you can filter on the left side and you're seeing some records. And I'm gonna focus on the record for Tui Levuka. Um, the second is a cropped uh, uh, result for what we call our search result or our search record um, and has some of the detail. If you follow the link uh, there, you'll see the, um, the entire record as we present it and the metadata that we present as well. Um, again, not all of the metadata, uh, but um, our sort of selection of metadata. But you can see here as well, the, the key is that the thumbnail uh, is, is made um, the hero. Uh, and this third slide is the source record um, from the source repository, which is, as you can see, a very different uh, visual look and feel I think it's important to acknowledge the source, which is the National Library of New Zealand, uh, where I'm a director. Um, but I think it's also useful to be able to, as with these three slides, to a bit of a compare and contrast exercise, and also to critique this interface. Um, because to what this design means for Pacific people, who again, don't know that A, this record exists, B, that the institution exists. Um, if this was the first interface that a Pacific person uh, was to use to uh, was to encounter when they were finding these records um, the the challenge that it is the cognitive load that it is given uh, as one of our users said I like your site because my grandma could use it because she can speak English but she can't read English how much of our designs of our of our interfaces and our repositories are absolutely based on the assumption that everyone can read English uh, and make sense of it and I think that's a a really useful critique as we have tried to design uh, our, our site, which makes uh, visibility and access to these source records easier for specific people. We also uh, realized early on that for Pacific people, their culture is lived and living. It's held in stories, songs, and carving, uh, in navigation and food preparation, in dance, uh, and many other uh, aspects of, of how they um, express themselves. So we're keen to reflect that reality. Uh, and as a number of our Pacific-based content partners are using platforms such as YouTube, uh, we highlight those and select those. Now, I appreciate, I really appreciate that YouTube is not archival standard. Um, so it's not, um, you know, we don't recommend it as a source repository, but if it is the only platform that an institution or a Pacific-based community can use, 
we wanted to honor that. One of our content partners on the screen here, NGO Pacifica Renaissance, has since 2014 recorded oral histories and stories of Micronesia told by the residents of those islands in their languages whilst they sit on their land. Uh, and if you get the chance to explore their, their YouTube channel, they have an incredible array of audio and video recordings. Um, their only platforms are YouTube and Facebook, and we share about, about 800 of these videos. If they had not done this work over the last 10 years or so, if they had not recorded those stories, many of those featured in um, these videos have passed on, uh, and their knowledge uh, within them and their stories would have been lost to us and to those communities of Micronesia. So I think that in creating this space, Digital Pacific, um, that holds or makes uh, visible records like those on YouTube, alongside those of institutions such as um, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science or the US National Archives, enables us to ask um, the question, when art institutions hold Pacific artifacts as static frozen things, on shelves or on boxes, and detailed with academic metadata, are they really preserving them, abstracted as they are from the lived knowledge of their um, existence? And if we do so uh, in this way, which is, can be valued uh, and is valuable, who are we preserving and protecting them for them? Uh, as again, as I've said a number of times, Pacific people mostly don't know that these institutions A, exist, and B, uh, that they hold these records, because the vast majority of them aren't on display even if you could get to the institutions. My institution, National Library of New Zealand, apparently holds the tanoa of Robert Louis Stevenson. The tanoa is the wooden bowl into which uh, you make, make and mix uh, kava. The first time I saw this, I asked if we could make kava in it. Um, and there was quite a look of confusion on the curators because kava involves pouring water into the thing, into the bowl, uh, which, I, and I understood that confusion because, you know, water and artifacts don't usually go well together. But also I had to think from a Pacific person perspective, what is the point of storing a bowl designed to make and share kava uh, if it's never used to do so? For a Pacific person, then just storing these records and objects makes little sense in and of itself. The culture and heritage value for us is not embodied only in the object. It's what the object enables and what it connects us to. So how do we make that accessible? In a Pacific way, it is the relationships that matter. Um, the Pacific Ocean covers 33% of the surface area of the globe. Across this vast ocean and the 22 Pacific Island countries and territories, uh, across it live millions of people whose heritage and culture goes back uh, hundreds of years. And that heritage is now scattered across the planet. We have sought to create a space that enables Pacific people to access the content and taonga held by the global cultural heritage sector as well as to honor the work of that same sector. In doing so, we have designed a site that serves, we believe, as a bridge between the worlds of Pacific peoples and the worlds of these institutions. We also seek to highlight Pacific-based uh, community groups and institutions, their artifacts, their records, and their stories in ways that are relevant to their cultures and to use the digital platforms that they can leverage from their islands uh, and to make them visible and accessible as well. This approach, I appreciate, can push at our a sort of standardized Western norms of knowledge and organization. But we also, but also obviously seeks to center a lived Pacific experience and authority in a way that empowers these communities to make and own decisions on their terms. We are hopeful that our site serves as a mirror, a mirror for cultural heritage institutions, in that their metadata is available to view in a different way. Uh, and um, provides visibility to how they are making sense of the records they hold. Um, the mirror construct asks cultural heritage institutions to consider how they might better record and provide access to metadata and to imagine how they might come into relationship with not just the artifacts of the Pacific, the records of the Pacific, but the people of the Pacific. Opeta Aliafayo, uh, formerly of the National Archives of Fiji, uh, and a member of our co-design group spoke of the site and he said, it's one thing for Pacific people to know that they had their culture taken away from them. That is the legacy of colonialism. It's another thing entirely to not know that the artifacts and records of their cultures still exist. Our hope is that this site helps those records, artifacts and images become visible and accessible to more Pacific people. 
Um, our hope is that our project and the kaupapa, which we have woven through our work, will enable and enhance the knowledge and the mana of Pacific people, wherever they may be, who are carving and creating their cultures uh, and lives right now. Um, thank you for your time. Um, we, um, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to go get, I um, uh, hope you've enjoyed listening to this. Uh, I'll stop the recording now uh, and we look forward to catching up with you in person. Kia ora. <laughs>